as a producer, I'm offered up actors all the time. And it's so tempting because I know I'll get the, the project made, but it's wrong. Right. It's not right. I'm putting in an actor in a role that I feel he can't handle or isn't right for or the audience isn't going to believe. Now, I'm all for, yes, can Will Ferrell do drama? Yes, but it's got to be the right drama. Mm-hmm. You know, can, can a comedian, can Jim Carrey do, you know, do drama as well? Yes, if it's, it's the right role. Can a dramatic actor do comedy? Uh, not so much. <laughs> Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Matthew Berry's on the show today. Matthew is a Los Angeles-based actor, casting director, and acting teacher. Matthew's film career was launched in the late 70s at the age of 15, when he landed a role opposite Jill Clayburg in the Bernardo Bertolucci film, Luna. In the 1980s, Matthew landed multiple roles on television series like Family Ties and Cagney and Lacey, as well as films like Indecent Proposal with Robert Redford, Demi Moore, and Woody Harrelson, and Ed Wood, directed by Tim Burton, and starring Johnny Depp and Bill Murray. By the early 90s, Matthew found his way into casting, becoming one of the most sought-after casting directors in Hollywood. Matthew was the casting director on the Nick Cassavetes films Unhook the Stars with Gina Rollins and Marissa Tomei, She's So Lovely with John Travolta, Sean Penn, Robin Wright Penn, and James Gandolfini, John Q. starring Denzel Washington, The Notebook starring Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams, and Alpha Dog, starring Justin Timberlake, Emile Hirsch, and Amanda Seyfried. Matthew was also the casting director on Con Air with Nicolas Cage and John Malkovich, Rush Hour and Rush Hour 2 with Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker, as well as the soon-to-be-released film All-Star Weekend, written and directed by Jamie Foxx and starring Robert Downey Jr., Gerard Butler, and Benicio Del Toro. If you want to see Matthew's full list of television and film credits, Go to his IMDb page, which I'll link in the show notes, because there are just too many cool credits to include in this intro. I've talked to creatives from many industries on the podcast, but Matthew was the first casting director I've interviewed. It was nice hearing from Matthew about how casting directors fit into the film world and how important they are to the process. Casting is an aspect of filmmaking that is so behind the scenes, so off the radar to most audiences, yet it's so integral to how a film comes together. So I'm glad Matthew took time to sit down and tell us his story. So let's jump right into my chat with actor and casting director, Matthew Berry. Hey. Hey, hey there. Matthew. <laughs> What's up, bro? Hey, hey, not much, man. Thanks for making time for me. You got an old Gretcho up there? You know, it's a, I'll, I'll, it's, a, it's an old Gibson. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. A, an F hole Gibson. And it's, um, I, I bought it from a friend of mine. It was sitting in his closet for many, many years, and it's one of my favorite guitars now. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Do you play? I did. I'm an old punk from New York. Oh, yeah? Right yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. I did the CBGBs and the Mud Club and all those places way back in the day. Oh, right on. So yeah. what, what time frame was that? 70s? No, early, early 80s. In 1981, 82, mostly 82 before I came out here. Okay. Because I know yeah. you're fr- friends with Chris Kincaid, and I think Chris was in, you know, uh, playing with Rail back in the '70s, and so yeah. I thought maybe you were in that same generation. But yeah, no, I was I was a New Yorker, born and raised. So yeah, I, got, uh, I, I was uh, very very inundated in the uh, in the punk scene. So oh, it was, right uh, on. Yeah, yeah. So, so what made you um, leave music and head to uh, New York music anyway, and, and head to L.A.? Well, I think that you know, I, I, one, I wasn't very good. Uh, two, I was much better at acting and making a better living at, <laughs> at acting than, than I probably would have made it, uh, making money in music. Uh-huh. So, but, but I had a, I had a great time, great time playing with some, some great people and great clubs and just had a good time. You know, when you're young, you, you know, you, you try things out. So, yeah. So where in New York did you, or were you born and raised? I was, I was actually, I was born in Brooklyn, but I don't remember Brooklyn because we moved to the projects when I was two years old in Chelsea. Oh. Uh, and so I lived in the projects until I was eight. And then my parents moved down to this huge 
artist complex down in Greenwich Village, which uh, I grew up with guys like Vin Diesel and uh, uh, Dash Mihawk, who's on uh, Ray Donovan. Wow. Um, and a lot of Josh Hamilton. I mean, there's so many great artists that came from, uh, from this place called West Beth. And that's basically where, where I grew up. And um, yeah, it was this huge 385 apartments. It's just great complex with all these, all these kids. All, we all grew up together. And uh, quite a lot of famous people, too. Gil Evans was, you know, the great jazz musician, was my, uh, my neighbor. Uh, and I played with his two kids, Miles and Noah. Um, and it's, and it's funny, I, I like to tell this story where, you know, I was playing with Miles and Noah and Gil, who's a very famous jazz musician would be composing upstairs. And one day this, this guy walks in and he was the scariest African-American guy I'd ever seen in my life. turns out it was Miles, Miles Davis. What, what was so scary <laughs> about him? Just intense. Oh, he was just so intense. And just like this, you know, just these deep set eyes. It's like, you take one look at him and he's just got this energy. He just had this energy. And I was like, Whoa, you know, as a kid, you know, you're easily intimidated. Right. Right. You know? And so, and so this, this guy walks in and, 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 and I was like, uh, and I didn't know who he was. And my, I told my mom, I was like, yeah, it was a scary. It was like, Oh yeah, that's Miles Davis. No you know, way. He comes in, Cause him and him and uh, Gil were, were collaborating, collaborating on an album. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's I had a, I had a pretty 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 nice uh, childhood. I can't I can't complain. I would imagine that that type of be, being in that environment would be formative in terms of your direction artistically. Yeah, I mean it it definitely we we liked to we all got together and played music. We we had um down in the in the basement of this building, there were all these studios and basically <laughs> We, we bribed the management. We said, look, you can give us one of these studios for free or we can tear this place down. <laughs> and so they relented and gave us our own studio where we could go and jam and, and experiment and play music and hang out and, you know, and do things that, you know, teenagers do. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we just had the greatest time. I mean, like all day, every day, just experimenting and playing, you know, playing music. Who were your influences back then? Zappa, Frank Zappa oh, was, okay. it still is to this day. I mean, Frank, is, his music was just so, it just, I was probably 11 years old in summer camp and and I heard this music coming from the camp counselors, you, you know, a bunk area. And I remember I was so fascinated. It was overnight sensation. Um, and I was fascinated by this music. And when the camp counselors went out to go get some, some chow, I snuck into their camp and looked at the, the record. And that was one of the very first purchases when I was 13 years old and made money. The very first purchase I made was Overnight Sensation by Frank Zappa. And then, of course, I had to buy the entire back catalog. And it was just incredibly just inspired by, by, by Frank. And then a little later on, it was Elvis Costello. Mm. You know, who, who came, who came out of the punk scene, but was more, you know, pop punk. Right. Um, and so he was, he was very much, much the inspiration, but you know, Zappa and, and his music, it was, it was just, just in, incredible. So he was the one that kind of influenced where, where I wanted to go, even though I, I, I kind of geared more the band I had was more, more towards the, the, the punk scene and, yeah. you know, just having good old rock and roll, you know? Well, Zappa to me is like, if, if that's your first it's what you're gravitate, gravitating towards first. The analogy I would use is if you're a grade school kid and the first book you open is like a neurosurgery book <laughs> or something. <laughs> I like That's the most inaccessible, difficult music to understand and, and yeah. absorb, you know, and you're going right there to Zappa, right to the most <laughs> right. and abstract. It's like, <laughs> and, if, and I look at the charts today and I go, are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just wow. Yeah, yeah. What what a loss that was to. But but yeah. Dweezil seems to be kind of carrying on the the family. He torch. has, and I got to tell you, because I've seen I've seen probably every one of Dweezil's shows when he when he comes to town, or even when he's not in. You know, I follow him around to San Diego, or you know, when he goes up north. And it's just uh, technically speaking, he's he's much better than Frank, except Frank had Frank had such uh, emotion when he played. Frank played with emotion. Dweezil is, is technically incredible. Yeah. Uh, but it's, and it's, and that band, that band he has is just tight, you know, as Frank's bands were. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to see Frank a few times uh, as well. Um, but it was, um, 
Yeah, I've, I've seen Dweezil quite a number of times. So any of you listening to this or watching this, you know, look up Frank's music, you know, go to Overnight Sensation or One Size Fits All, uh, just incredible musicianship. And if, you know, if you're a fan of music then, and you don't know Frank's, Frank's music, then, you know, I, I really uh, say that you should go, go, go listen and pick up some albums. Definitely. Yeah. So how did you make your way into acting? Well, I grew up, uh, my dad is a Broadway playwright and he ran a theater company in New York called the uh, Hudson Guild Theater Company, which was right down the block from my school. And when I would go, I would, instead of going home, I would go to the theater, which was right down the block and I would sit and do my homework in, in, the, in the pews, I guess. And, uh, and I would watch him work with the actors all day long. And I was just fascinated where, where, you know, where, you know, watching him direct and watching him get out of the actors, what, what he could get out. And I was one day, I think it was eight years old. I said, uh, well, I want to do that. And, um, he, he said, okay. You know, so he, he, you know, my dad was a little, little, little tough, you know, tough Irishman. And, uh, and so he, you know, he worked me pretty good and he was like, all right, this, this kid's got some natural talent. And I auditioned for this uh, off-Broadway play at the, the at the Roundabout Theater, which is now a Broadway, considered Broadway. And I got cast when I was eight years old in this really bizarre piece called A Piece of Fog. And that was kind of my introduction to the stage. Uh, and then it just kind of blossomed from there. I wound up doing a, a TV series when I was 13 years old uh, called Ivan the Terrible for a CBS. It was terrible. Uh, but I got a very, very quick ed- education from all the great, um, like Borscht Belt comedians, um, who were, who were, you know, in the show and they taught me like everything about sitcoms and beats and, you know, it was just a, an incredible education. Um, and then the big break came when I was 15. Um, I, I, I started in a, a Bernardo Bertolucci film called Luna. And how that came about was I auditioned for it. And uh, I, at the time, Liv Ullman was, was the great you know, actress. Liv Ullman was slated to play the lead in the movie. And I was deemed too young for the part. So the casting director put my picture in the reject pile. And when Liv fell out and Jill Clayburgh uh, uh, came in, uh, by accident... Bernardo's wife walked into the wrong room. Uh, she was looking for the, for the exit to go to the bathroom and she walked into this other room and she literally saw my picture standing there on the top of the reject pile. And she wow. picked it up and she looked at it and she showed it to <laughs> Bernardo and she said, this, she told this all to me, of course, you know, post film. And she said to Bernardo, she goes, this is the kid. Wow. And so they called me back and I came in and everybody had been sucking up to, to Bernardo because he was Italian and they played soccer. And, they, and so he's asking me all these questions. And I was just this naive kid who was just very open and honest. And he was like, well, what's your favorite sport? I was like, baseball. He was like, really? <laughs> Tell me about that. And I was just like, went on and on and on and on about baseball and the Yankees and blah, blah, blah. And, and he said, okay. So he tested me with eight others. And by the time lunch uh, uh, arrived, there, it was down to three. And it, it turned out to be me, um, my friend Todd Graff, who was who's an actor and, and now a director, uh, and a friend of mine. So we were, we were up against each other and uh, some, somebody else. And they eventually narrowed it down to myself and Todd. And after hours and hours of going back and forth with, with, with Jill, uh, I got cast in the lead and literally the next day, um, they, they called my, my parents and they were like, well, we need to come over and talk to you about this. Cause it's, you know, the, the, the film subject is a little heavy and <laughs> to my say mom the and least. Dad, yeah. And, and my mom and dad, you know, they, they were, you know, they came over and they were like, we've seen last Django. We know what we're getting into. Okay. So, <laughs> That's so, all you need to see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so they came over and literally like two days later on 4th of July, I was on a plane to Italy and, and with, with, with my dad and, and I was just like, <laughs> I had no idea what was happening. And I spent four months uh, in Italy shooting, shooting the film. Well, I, I watched it last night, the Italian version on YouTube, because I couldn't find it anywhere else. I, I was looking for it on streaming services. It, it just, it just came out. It just came out. on. Oh, it's uh, on DVD now. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. I'll check out the, the English language version, but 
yeah, I, I watched it in Italian and of course didn't really understand <laughs> some, but I could, I could definitely, I read the Wikipedia description of it. So I knew what was happening as I was watching and I was struck at a couple of things. Uh, first of all, as a first time film actor, you are involved in this film, this Berlucci uh, drama that I, I would imagine at the time you may you may not be understanding where it's going because these scenes are so long and that he lets things simmer and there's just it, there's not a lot of action and there's a lot of emotion but not a lot of action so at the time when you were in the film did you really were you grasping what what bernardo was trying to accomplish or the storyline was it sinking in for you at the age of 15 no freaking idea. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of got a grasp of it. You know, it's, I was, I was, I was still a virgin at the time. Uh, you know, I lost my virginity on the film on my 16th birthday. Uh, <laughs> so I was getting, I was getting a very, very fast education into sexuality. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my mom was there with me. Uh, uh, my dad was there the first month and then my mom came and my mom was very, very open uh, and we had a lot of discussions about it and it was, it was, it was a quick education, Yeah, you know, like, like, like any, like anything in life, you know, we get, we get thrown into it. We, we, we go, you know, okay, you know, all right, here we, here we go. You know, yeah. you, you, you learn and you learn quickly. It's just like, you know, the first time after you, you know, you pass the, pass the bar, you know, the, the first time you were ever in front of a judge, you were like, you know, you're nervous. But then, of course, after the first time, you know, it, it gets easier and easier and easier the more the more times you're in front of the, front of the judge. Mm -hmm. The second observation I had was probably the more obvious one that most people would ask, which is how did your parents and the director and you navigate this, these scenes where you are you're basically in very sexually pr provocative scenes with this adult woman, Jill Clayberg. Yeah. And, um, the legality of it, I'm wondering about because I don't know if Italy just has more lax laws or what, what, how were you navigating that and your parents and Bernardo? Do you remember? I think it, you know, at the, at the time, again, this was, 77. So it wasn't, you know, the seventies were a very weird time. You know, we're coming out of, out of the sixties and the seventies was very strange, a strange period to, for everybody to, to grow up in. Um, at, at the time, you know, at the time it wasn't as, as bad, I think until, uh, uh, what was the Brooke Shields movie that, that, that came out? The, the, was it the Louis Mal film? Oh, uh, blue, Lag blue. Lagoon? No, no, no. Before, or, before, oh, before, before that, that. The, yeah, the one Lolita. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was, it was, you know, there wasn't so much of a controversy until that film came out where it wasn't, it wasn't as, as prevalent as it is now, you know, the, the sexual predators and, and, right. and, and such, it was kind of, it was kind of, eh, you know, it was back then it was understood. Now it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, it it's was, taboo. Back then it, was, it was called, yeah. right, right. So it, it was, it was, it was a, it was a different time. So it was, it was a little more understandable you know so to speak back mm -hmm. then yeah where you know everybody was kind of coming off the 60s where it was free love and and everything else and so it kind of you know it was the, the the tail end of the of the 70s so it was it, again it was it was kind of understood and and again europeans uh, americans are very are very you know tight when it comes to sexuality europeans are incredibly open yeah um, if, if any of you have ever spent spend time in Europe, it's very it's very free. It's not it's not it's not as as as, as emotional as mm -hmm. we are in, in in America. It's very kind of hey, you know, let's let's get together and let's you know let's have sex. We, and, and you know, America's like oh no, we 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 can't do that. But there in 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 Europe, it was very hey, you know, let's let's just have a good time. Hmm. Um, and I think that's if you look at that that the films from the, from that era, it 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 sparks to it. Yeah. Where it's in America, we were still kind of, you know, very, very, you know, conservative, so to speak, compared to the rest of the world or most of the world or compared to Europe anyway. When the film was released, were you tuned in to like reviews and how well it was received? And were you kind of paying attention to that aspect of the, uh, the movie? I was completely overwhelmed. 
uh, when the film came out, I was 17 and it was New York and it was 79 and it opened the New York Film Festival. And I had so much smoke blown up my ass. Can I say ass on the, on the sure, podcast? Sure, you can. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I, re I remember the the, pr the premiere in New York. It, it opened the uh, the New York Film Festival, closed, closing that at the New York Film Festival. And I had Richard Gere come up to me and just tell me how great I was and my performance was and um, played Dick Tracy. Help me out. Oh, Warren Beatty. Warren Beatty. Warren Beatty came up to me and 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 was just like, God damn, kid. You know, and so and, and I got the greatest lesson. I got the greatest lesson from Warren Beatty because I literally said, can I ask you something, Mr. Beatty? He smiled. He said anything. I said, how do you do it? And he said, do what? He goes, how do you get all those beautiful women? And he smiled. <laughs> he smiled at me and he said, just let them talk. Uh, <laughs> great <laughs> advice. It's, it's, it's worked. Great, great <laughs> advice. And then Woody Allen was inviting me to his to his place to 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 go you know party with him and his friends and Diane Keaton was coming. I'm like, holy shit! You know, as a 17 year old, it's like I, I, my mind was blown. And then what happened was um, cocaine. Oh. And uh, 80s. and uh, yeah, eight yeah, 70s yeah late, 80s, late, yeah, late 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 seventies, early eighties, and you know, I was invited to Studio Fifty Four, and so when you give a seventeen year old that and the great reviews and you know and and whatnot, and uh, and you're hanging out, and and Andy Warhol wants to interview you, and 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 I'm I'm just like my you know I was just like yeah, couldn't handle, just didn't didn't handle it at all, and it's it's. It just, it was a disaster. <laughs> How long did that disaster last? What yeah, was that time frame? It, yeah, it was, it was, it was, you know, it's, you, you get, you get caught up in the, in the hype. And, and again, I mean, I, I moved to, uh, to Los Angeles. I made a bet with my parents. I said, I said, if I can make more money than you, you know, can I move to Los Angeles? And they were like, yeah, sure. So shortly after the film, I went to Los Angeles because that's where the fun is. And, you know, I had the greatest you know, agent in the world. Ed Lamata was my agent, who was, who was uh, uh, Richard Gere's agent, who was uh, Mel Gibson's agent, who was Denzel's agent, who was Michelle Pfeiffer's agent. So I went to his house and I'm hanging out with all of them. And I'm like, one of these things just doesn't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> and like Madeline Kahn became my friend. I'm like, holy shit. So, wow. and you know, and then Los Angeles in the eighties was quaaludes and, and lots of partying. Mm -hmm. And so we partied and we partied pretty freaking hard. And then River Phoenix died. And that was kind of the end of the party. River Phoenix died. John Belushi died. And so it was kind of like, uh, okay, it's, it's over. Kind of a wake and up call. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a wake up. The real wake up call for me was, um, Dennis Quaid was a friend of mine and, uh, he had been dating my cousin Leah Thompson at the time, and they were living together. And he wanted me to come in and audition for uh, a role in a, in a film that really launched his career called The Big Easy. Hmm. And I, I said, okay, one. I, I said yeah. it was fantastic. And yeah. and and I said to Dennis, I said, well, let me come in. I don't want to, you know, I want to get this part on my own. I don't want, I don't want to get this part because I'm a friend of yours. He was like, okay, okay, whatever you want, Matt. So I went in and auditioned for it and crushed it. And the casting director at the time, Lynn, the great Lynn Stallmaster, who was one of the top casting directors in Hollywood at the time, turned to Dennis, and again, not knowing that we were friends, and he said, uh, don't hire him. And he was like, why not? He was like, he's, he's effed up, he's, he's on drugs, and, and, and you know, he, he's a disaster. Hmm. And of course, Dennis told me this, and that was my wake-up call. And so, you know, that was it. How did you know, they know just by looking at you or by reputation? Re reputation. What, what, yeah. what really, what really happened was, is I did an interview, uh, with interview magazine, Warhol's magazine, uh, with a couple of his people from, uh, from the factory. And basically they got me really, really, uh, high, so to speak, and asked me questions that they probably shouldn't have asked. And being the open, honest person that I was, I answered them all. And of course, they printed them all. Uh -huh. And I basically pissed off a lot of people. Uh -huh. uh, and basically admitted to, you know, to being this fucked up kid. 
Yeah. Um, sorry, messed up kid. And so. Oh, you can you can cuss. It's fine. Oh, good. It's, it's a podcast. New Yorker. So. <laughs> um, and so it, it, that that pretty much ruined my career uh, at, at the time. And it took me, it took me a while to kind of get it back and to kind of prove to everybody that, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm cool. I'm, I'm clean. I'm fine. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm back, you know, we, we all, we all deserve a second chance. And so, um, um, Eileen Starger, who was a casting director, really took a, a liking to me and put me in a, in a couple of films and that kind of relaunched my, my, my career. Yeah. Was the Wraith one of those films? That was yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was that was the 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 first film that she cast me, and it was it was interesting because if the the description in in the uh, in the in the script and in the breakdown was a blonde blue eyed hunk. Well, let's you know <laughs> strike strike one, strike two, and you know yeah. strike three. And I was a skinny little kid, and 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 the director looked at me, Mike Marvin, who's one of my best friends today. Um, he looked at me, he looked at Eileen and was like, what, what the hell is this? And she was like, he's a great actor. He's a great actor. Just trust me. And I did my thing. And he was like, wow, he's fantastic. And I, I beat out a lot of people. I beat out Johnny Depp. Um, so direct, director, director, uh, Mike, <laughs> nice. Mike told me so. So yeah, <laughs> that's great. Is that where you met Nick? Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, it's very, it's very odd that, you know, you, you, you do a film, you do it, you, you get very intimate on these films for, you know, a couple of months. And then you kind of go your separate ways and, you know, you might have a friend, you know, or two, you know, kind of acquaintance, but we all became best of friends for years. I mean, I'm still friends with Charlie Sheen to this day. Um, you know, Nick, I've known since, since the film and we've worked together now, well, if you can, you can see behind me, oh, yeah. two of the, two of the three films, um, I've done every one of his films and we've just been just this incredible collaboration you know, over the, over the years and, you know, watched our families grow, um, and, 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 you know, wives and girlfriends, and we've just been incredibly supportive of each other for God, how, how long was that for 30 years ago, 30 plus years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so, looking at the, you know, the, I, when I was interviewing Nick Cassavetes and I said, Nick, it's Nick Cassavetes for the listeners. Um, but when I was interviewing Nick, I was looking at his filmography and then I was talking to Chris Kincaid and, mm -hmm. and, and I, I was looking at your filmography and then I'm seeing all of this crossover and I'm seeing Clint Howard is popping up in a lot of Nick's movies and yeah. Mike Marvin. And there's just this, it, it looked to me like there was a family, this very tight knit tribe of, of friends that were sticking together, you know, as much as they could in the industry. Is that how you remember the last 30 years is just you, you meet this core group of friends in the, in the eighties and like Nick and Mike and, 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 uh, these folks that you acted with. Um, and then you're just in those same circles for, for decades. It's, it's loyalty. It's very, I, I've found in my years and years and years in, in, in Hollywood that, you know, loyalty is something you don't often very find. And Nick has been, incredibly loyal. Mike has been loyal and I'm a very, I'm a very loyal person to a fault. And, you know, Nick grew up with obviously John Cassavetes who basically his ma his mantra was work with your friends. And if you look at John's films, he worked with the same people over and over and over again. And mm -hmm. I think that kind of trickled down to, to Nick and, you know, Nick has been, you know, incredibly loyal. And again, we really work well together. And I think it's also, uh, he trusts me. I trust him. I don't blow smoke up his ass. I tell him honestly what I think. And he, he, you know, when, when I don't like something, I, 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 I tell him and he doesn't like it, but he knows, he always knows I'm going to tell him the truth instead of blowing smoke up his ass. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm just going to, I mean, I've had, you know, films that he's wanted to do. And I go, Nick, I hate this movie. I, I don't <laughs> want to do this movie. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know why you're doing that. Why you want to do this movie? It was all oh, cause I like it. I'm passionate about it. I go, I don't, I don't understand why. Cause, right. cause I want to do it. But that's, that's our relationship. And that's, you know, it's been a, 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 a fantastic, you know, uh, Keith Richards, Mick Jagger kind of yeah. collaboration for, for years. So that's how, well, really, if you look back, that's probably how you got the part in Luna is your honesty with Bernardo Bertolucci. Yeah. 
just, yeah. you know, you're not trying to tell him what he wants to hear. You're telling him what you really feel. I, I, I think that's, I, that's how I got the TV series as well. Cause I remember walking into the audition and you know, that I, I can't remember what the question, but I remember they asked me a question and I answered honestly. And I remember them just all cracking up. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I wound up doing a, uh, um, uh, 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 at the same time of the TV series, a Broadway play uh, called Legend, which <laughs> opened and closed in one night. And, <laughs> and I got that role as well because the, the director made me run around the stage and then they asked me a question and I just answered honestly and I made them crack up. And so that's kind of, that's kind of helped me along the way in my entire life is just, is just being, just being blatant, you know, not, not sugarcoating, right. which, which hope I'm hoping in this, on this podcast is, is they're getting a sense of, you know, yeah. who, who I am and what I am as well. Yeah. But I guess we have to contrast that with, uh, with the drug fueled honesty in the Andy Warhol interview. <laughs> yeah. We got to be yeah. a little bit careful <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. With your learned, honesty. Learn my lesson. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so tell me about casting and being a casting director and how that evolved from acting into casting actors and films. It was, it was interesting. I was, I was doing some really bad television shows. Um, and, and I was, I was about to turn 30 and I remember I was on the set of some really bad TV show that I was doing. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm just doing this for the money. And it was good money, but I remember think I remember feeling so unsatisfied. And so I wanted to do something else. And so I went to UCLA film film school and you know, wanted to learn everything there was about about producing and production and quickly realized I knew everything because I'd, you know, grown up on, on sets my entire life. So they weren't really teaching me anything new. And so I had a, a friend of mine who worked for uh, Barry Levinson. And she asked Barry if she could, you know, hook me up and get me. I said, look, I'll be a PA. I'll sweep floors. I'll go get your laundry. I'll do anything. I just want to be on the set behind the scenes learning everything about what everybody does. I want to know what a gaffer was. I want to know what a gaffer is, you know, and what he, and, and what he did and what the electrician did and what, you know, what, every, what everybody's function was and how to deal with people. And so she introduced me to uh, Mark Johnson, who, you know, in his own right is a phenomenal producer. And I've done a couple of projects with him since. And he said, okay, uh, you know, let me, let me see what I can, I can find for you. And he called me a couple of days later and he said, well, they need some help in casting. You know, do you want to work? You know, I said, okay, I'll work in casting, but you know, when it's over, you know, I want to work on the set. He was like, okay, okay. You know, you know, calm down. So Ellen Chenoweth, I worked for Ellen Chenoweth, the great Ellen Chenoweth. Uh, and just busted my ass and, and, you know, I knew actors and she knew, and, uh, you know, pretty much everybody knew me from, from Luna. So she was like, why are you doing this? I was like, I just, you know, I wanted, I want to do something new, but she was, uh, she really took me under, under her wing. And I, again, I, I worked at, you know, the Robin Williams film toys, which is a project I worked on. And really helped her out. And once that was done, uh, you know, I, I went back to Mark and I was like, okay, okay, I can, you know, ready to sweep floors now. And he said, yeah, we had to give that job to, you know, the director's friend or the producer's friend or somebody else. So I went home and cried for two days. <laughs> and then I get a call from uh, Vicki Thomas, who is, who was just honored by the Casting Society of America uh, for being one of the best casting directors in, in, in the world for the project that she's worked on. And so she called me up and she goes, uh, Chenoweth says you're, you're pretty good. I'm like, yeah, yeah. She goes, can you come down and, and, and interview with me? I was like, sure. I was like, when? She goes now. And so I said, okay. So I drove down to Paramount studios and this beautiful African-American woman, just gorgeous woman. And she said, look, I've just come off of working for, uh, Francis Ford Coppola on Dracula and he kind of beat the shit out of me and I just did White Man Can't Jump and I'm, I'm really tired and I'm dealing with this maniac Adrian Lyne uh, on this film called Indecent Proposal and I just need somebody to kind of babysit him and you know just take you know take the pressure off of me I was like give me the ball give me the nice. ball and I said I said when do you want me to start and she was like now <laughs> I was like okay <laughs> And I was introduced to Adrian and Adrian knew who I was from, from, you know, what the hell are you doing here? I was like, I'm here to, I'm here to help you out. And so 
I had a very, very interesting relationship with, with Adrian. And one of the first things that Adrian had me do uh, after we had cast uh, uh, Demi and, um, and uh, Woody was he comes to me and he says, listen, Matt, he says, I, I, I need you to find me this great Brit guy. He goes, I need you to find me like, uh, like two people to, you know, that, that look like Woody, that look like Woody and, and Demi and, and I need them to jam. I said, what do, you, what do you mean you need them to jam? He said, I, I want them to jam, man. You know, and you know, right? I was like, you, you want them to have sex? He said, like, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, like, that's, I said, Adrian, that's, that's pornography. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can find that for me, right? <laughs> so I, so I go to Vicky. I goes, he wants me to find these two actors to, to have sex, you know, these two doubles to, and it was like, just give Adrian what he wants. So it turns out I was, I was playing baseball out here with, a guy named Randy West, who just happened to be the Robert Redford of the uh, uh, adult I- uh, entertainment industry. <laughs> so I said, uh, you want to come in and audition for a, you know, a feature film? He goes, hell yeah. So I introduced him to Adrian and Adrian flips out because he looks just like Robert Redford. I mean, he's, you know, he, he's, he could be, he, he was the, you know, the Robert Redford of, of, uh, of the, 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 the adult entertainment industry. So I said, okay. So he was happy. So now I got to find the, the Demi for him to have sex with on camera. <laughs> so, so I bring him, I, I find this girl dead ringer for Demi, you know, but this girl was so stupid that, you know, if you blew in her ears, her eyes would spin. So it's a joke. You can, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, so I bring this girl there and she's as dumb as a box of rocks and Adrian, Adrian blows up at me. And starts cursing me out, and you know the pressures of being director. And I'm letting him take it out of me. He goes, "What the hell are you bring me?" You know, he's, he's screaming. And I looked at him and I say, "Adrian, if you talk to me that way again, I'm going to come over to the other side of the desk and I'm going to beat the shit out of you." Uh-huh. And I, as soon as I said it, I went, "Oh fuck, I'm fired." And it was that moment where you look at each other, where he's pissed off and he's got that look in his eye, and I'm like, "Okay, okay, you're fired." And then he just breaks out of this big grin and says, I like you. There's your honesty again. And so, yeah. and so he was like, and you know, uh, anytime, because this was before the internet, this was before, you know, everything. So literally when he was in Vegas, I had to drive all, <laughs> I had to drive, drive all of the audition tapes to Vegas and hang out and, and wait for Adrian in his room and show him all the tapes. And we had a, we had a great time. And then when we had the, we had the, um, the table read with uh, when we hired Redford, it was Redford, Demi, and 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 Woody, and uh, Adrian called me in to read all the other roles and the stage directions and everything. So it was just basically the you know five of us and the producers in a room in Vegas reading the script, and I'm like, oh my god, this is fantastic! And that was kind of the the launch of of my casting career, and I owe I owe it all to Vicky because I got to work. You know, I, I jumped from that to, to working on Ed Wood with, with Tim Burton. I mean, are you kidding me? Oh, man. So it, yeah. was, it was, you know, and I, I, got, I worked with, you know, and then Jerry Bruckheimer. And it was just this incredible, quick, fast education. And again, I knew a lot of actors from my days as an actor. So I would bring them in and introduce them to, to, to Vicky and Jeannie McCarthy, who in her right man is a phenomenal casting director as well. Um, was working with uh, Vicky as well. So we had this incredible casting team. I mean, it was like an A plus casting team. And we just worked on these amazing films and we, you know, put together, you know, Con Air uh, with amazing cast in, in that. And just, Nicholas and Cage. Just, yeah. And just broke all these careers. And, um, and so that was kind of the, the, the launch of, of my career. And about four years later, it was, you know, it was time to move on and Jeannie was moving on and, and it was time for me to move on. And uh, I asked my, my, uh, my former agent, uh, Nancy, um, who worked at an at a, at a agency called Ambrosio Mortimer. And they were going through some problems and she was looking for a career change after 20 years. And I loved Nancy because she was like a great agent for me. And I said, well, why don't you come work with me? And she's like, what do you mean? She's like, come work in casting. She's like, I know nothing about casting. I said, you know actors, don't you? She goes, yeah. And so she said, okay. And so we branched off on our own, formed our own company. It was like, okay, now what? 
<laughs> now we kind of got to got to get some get some jobs. So we, we did a couple of little films, and then our, our our big break came from a woman named Valerie McCaffrey, who was the head of casting at New Line at the time, and she introduced us to this young whippersnapper named Brett Ratner, and oh, Brett. Brett and Brett as this you know the Rush Hour movies, yeah. and uh, and. Uh, uh, he was doing rush hour and his energy was just fantastic. And I loved his energy. I was like, Oh yes. Oh yeah. 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 And he loved us. Cause I, you know, I, I was still young and, and aggressive at the time. And, um, he, he took a spark to me and, and yeah, we worked our asses off and he was very, Brett is incredibly demanding and, you know, saw that, yeah, we worked our asses off and he was like, I need, I need every rock unturned. And so we unturned every, every rock to, to help him out. And then new line was, was impressed and the film was a hit. And so they gave me a bunch of films and I think I did seven or eight films for new line. And that was just, you know, my, my film, you know, skyrocketed. And then of course, you know, the notebook came out. I got a poster of it somewhere. Let me see. Oh yeah. Turn around the rest of it. Oh, it's over there. It's, sorry. It's hidden. Uh, then the notebook came out and that was, that was kind of like the, the, the icing on the cake. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's one of the, the quintessential, uh, casting. I mean, if you look at the casting choices in that film, it's it could have been a completely different uh, trajectory. I think for that movie, if it wasn't Gosling and McAdams. Sure. I mean, yeah. it, it wasn't Gosling and McAdams to begin with. Uh, who was it to begin with? <laughs> it was. I think at the time it was. It was going to be. Um, oh God, the kid's name is escaping me from Star Wars. Um, yeah, he was he was gonna gonna be in it, but he he wasn't the the greatest of actors. I'm sorry to say, back back then, uh, I think he proved himself a little later on. But he was he was the, the one of the originals. I think Reese Witherspoon was was one of the originals, but she she felt she was too old. And then uh, Nick went and met with Kate Beckinsale, and it wasn't quite a chemistry fit between between the two of them. So. Uh, so Nick turned to me and said, who you got? And we were doing this, uh, this other film. We were trying to get this other film off the ground about a year before. And I introduced him to uh, Ryan Gosling, who my partner flipped out over when she saw this little film called uh, uh, Believer, uh, where Ryan played this like neo-Nazi. Mm. And, um, and she just flipped for him. And he came in and met and we fell in love with him. And so he was the first person we, we mentioned with Ryan Gosling was like, absolutely. So he came in, was so smart, was, was just really right. And new line was smart enough to know that he was the next up and comer. And so they were like, okay, we like Ryan, but you got to find the girl. And so we started our search for the girl and, uh, and we started, you know, interviewing everybody. And, um, uh, I worked with Britney Spears for a couple of days. She came in at the height of her career and worked with her. I still have those tapes, which I have, I've shown my students, but I haven't released it to any, <laughs> to anybody, but my, my students get to, get to, get to see it. Oh, that's and, fun. and she came, she came in and like a whole bunch of other, we, we flew everywhere, uh, inter, interviewing, uh, actresses on, 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 on their sets. Um, uh, what's what's her name uh justin timberlake's wife oh um jessica beal jessica beal yeah we flew yeah. she she was she was doing uh texas chainsaw massacre and so we flew down to 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 texas to to where they were shooting and, and in her trailer we auditioned her then we flew to new york and interviewed all the you know the top people in, in new york and meanwhile our um uh, nancy and, and my agent at the time was uh, uh, Rachel McAdams agent at the time. And, and Rachel had just come out in this Rob Schneider film called the hot chick. Hmm. And we didn't, we didn't want to tell Nick, you know, Hey, she's the girl from the hot chick. She should be starring in this film. So we're like, eh, sh sh, you know, <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, Kenny, her agent at the time called up Nancy and says, Hey, I've got this, this girl, will you just meet her? And Nancy said, sure. I'll, you know, I'll, we'll do anything for you, Kenny. We love you. So Rachel came in, met with Nancy. Nancy was like, yeah, this, this girl's got something. So I said, here's 14 pages. Come back on Sunday. This was on a Friday. Come back on Sunday and, and come in an audition. So we fly in. We're, this was a Saturday. We spent all, 
all day auditioning people in New York and flew back on the on the red eye got barely a couple of hours of sleep and we were and and we had all this this big session set up with all the heavy hitters all you know you name them back then they were they were they were they were there uh and sat there and we looked at the list of everybody that's coming in and we're like who the fuck is rachel mcadams and nancy was like i liked her i met her it's 15 minutes you know let's give her a shot all right. You know, nobody knows who she is. Rest is history. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, on, on online is like one, one scene that, that, that they've shown, but no, she literally, there's three scenes that again, I have never released uh, that I only show my students, but it was literally a 14 page audition and she crushed it. Never in my, in my history up until Cat Williams came in and blew me away. Um, have I ever had an, an actor come in and just, floor me Hmm. and she came in and floored me and the rest is history so i i I don't understand much about the casting process and how a casting agency uh, gets paid and works with studios and directors can you tell my listeners the process from start to finish of okay we have we've been hired to cast this film how soon before shoot do you actually begin the process of finding talent? How do you do it? And then what type of contract do you enter into? Is it a, is it a flat rate? Is it an hourly? And I'm not asking for numbers, but I'm just curious about that relationship because I would imagine if you're casting an independent film, um, it's much different than if you're casting a big, you know, Marvel movie or something like that uh, for, for a variety of reasons. You've got, a lot more decision makers and people to answer to with the bigger films. Oh yeah. But can you tell us more about that dynamic? Back in the day, um, basically we're always the first on and the first off, which is really depressing sometimes because, you know, when everything's just about to go, we're like, okay, we need your offices, get out. (laughs) So we're always generally the first on. I think it's it's the casting directors and the DP and maybe the first AD who are always the first on. So, you know, there's there's barely anybody in in the offices. Uh, we're the ones that are uh, that sit down with the director and everything's calm because each week that's go by, that goes by, the director gets a little more <clears throat> tighter and tighter and tighter until he explodes because the director is always under tremendous pressure. So we're kind of there to guide him or her along and to collaborate and to to argue our points and the director will argue his or her points and to basically you know it's it's you know it's a puzzle and you have to everything has to be right it has to it has to look good i mean if you if those of you who watch movies and tvs you go you, you, everything's perfect we just watch them you know but everything is meticulously planned out and argued about and 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 put together because otherwise you know you can't have two people that look alike because the audience will be confused okay so we're always the first on and you sit down and we always have the director's attention. You stand, you make your lists of, of everybody that you, that you think will be, will be right for the, for the part. And then you call the agents and you set up meetings and, and, and independently, independently, you know, you, you make offers and eventually somebody will stick. Um, what happens is as you, you, you go, you go along and uh, back in the day, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, my brain is working faster than my mouth. My, before you used to get, you used to get like a flat rate or you get, you get like a step deal where, okay, you know, we'll pay you this amount of money until we get going. And then once the film gets going, we'll pay you this, this amount. Um, years ago, and I, I won't bore you with all the details, but I was on a, a, a plane when I was doing Rush Hour 2. And I was talk, I was sitting with uh, one of the, uh, the Teamsters and he was talking about union this and union that. And I'm like, we're, we're not union. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, we're, we're not union. Long story short, by the time I landed back in America, I was introduced to the Teamsters and fought with the Teamsters for five years to get a contract with the studios for the casting directors. And oh. so now, so now all the casting directors are union, and so nobody can can screw us over because casting directors used to get screwed over royally. Mm. And so thanks to the wonderful Steve Dayan, uh, who's now the president of the, of the Teamsters, 
um, he put together an incredible package for for the casting director. So now, even if you're independent, there's there's rates right. you know, f- for all of us, and so we we can't quite get screwed over because I have to sign a deal, you know, with with the casting directors. So so realistically, as of as of now, it's it's become a lot tougher than it, than it, than it was. You know, now everything is pre-sales and and tax credits, so it's 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 a bit more difficult to to, to cast a film because you need those names and everybody's doing the same thing. And there's there's charts everywhere and lists everywhere that you can you know you can get on the internet that that you know has foreign value. And there's a lot of brokers out there now who you know who will broker a film and they'll they'll sell the territory, so to speak. And this is long and boring for your listeners and viewers, <laughs> but so to speak. Basically, we round up coming coming back around. We're on first. It's usually a ten week deal. Uh, you'll you'll kind of get your your names settled, and then the rest of the cast kind of fills itself out. And you use a service called Breakdown Services, and you put down uh, you know what you're looking for, and all the pictures and resumes come in, as opposed to how it used to be, where the agents used to you know come to your office and and pitch. And we'd say, oh, yeah, we like him. We like her. Oh, this guy's interesting. Tell me about him. Tell me about her. Okay, we'll meet them. You know, now everything is, you know, you can do self-tapes and everything's online, which is wonderful. Um, but but basically, you know, you get you get to pick and choose and you set everybody up and you still talk to agents and everybody comes in the audition and, and you, your director makes makes their selections and, and your film is cast. Yeah, and if you're part of the union, you're going to get a minimum rate. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then yeah. if you're really well known in the industry and sought after, you're probably going to get paid more. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, I mean, look, it's just it's generally how it works. I it, it's we're 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 not making as as much as as we used to. I think back in the late '80s and '90s when it was when it was it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, we made we we made a very good living. No complaints at all. Now it's very corporate. Uh, you know, everybody has to. You know, everything is you know by the book. By the you, you know, it's, it's one, two, three, four, five. You know, there's six or seven people having to, you know, make a decision on one liners. So mm-hmm. it's it, it's a little it's a little tougher these days, and definitely not as much fun. Where it, you know it, it was really a director's medium. Uh, and it still is in the sense for the independent world. Uh, but the, the studio wise, it was definitely very, it, 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 it changed. It, it very much changed. Um, One of the most, uh, di- when I applied to law school, there was this law school admission test that I had to take. And the most difficult types of questions were called logic games and logic games were, uh, there's a dinner party and there's 15 people. And here are the rules. You have you're in charge of the seating chart. Right. Susan has to sit at the head of the table. Jerry cannot sit, you know, closer than two seats away from Susan, that type of thing. And what you right. described to me sounds like a really complicated logic game. <laughs> you know, all of these these moving parts that you're trying to get a handle on with the director and the producers and the actors, and there may be a great fit. You know, Rachel McAdams and Ryan Gosling might be perfect, but maybe Ryan's attached to another project. And so that's going to slow down when the shoot starts. And man, it just sounds like a, kind of a nightmare, frankly, <laughs> to be. It's, it, it, you know, it's not easy. It's, yeah. it's definitely it's it's not easy. I mean, I'm going through it now because, you know, I think independent films, it's been really, really tough over the years to get any independent film financed just because of the criteria. Yeah. Uh, and And the agents know it. You know, it's they they know that it's it's foreign sales and tax credits now, uh, and and so they know what their their clients are worth, and so you know you 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 make your pitch and you know they they all want to make sure that their clients are going to get paid and these are not going to fall up, uh, fall apart because, you know it's it's everybody's doing pretty much the same thing, and saying well you know I've got this great film and yes I've got I've got the financing I've got the financing but in reality you don't have the financing until the star kicks in. So it's kind of this roundabout catch 22 that you're always dealing with. Um, and very, very frustrating. And it's, 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 it's difficult to get anything made. But I think nowadays, if you can find a film where you can make, you know, for half a million to a million dollars, you're going to be golden. 
Hmm. You know, so you're going to, you're going to start to see a lot of road pictures pretty soon. You're going to see, you're going to see, you're going to see easy rider again, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, good, good old motorcycle movies, you know? Um, so, so what are, I, you know, when I look at your filmography, I, I, I notice kind of a lot of what I noticed about Nick's filmography because you work together a lot with him. Uh, but one thing that struck me is the new talent that emerges from these films like alpha dog and the notebook mm -hmm. and what what did you see in amanda seafried and um justin timberlake Emil <laughs> hirsch ben foster i mean ben foster is one of those guys that every movie i see him in he is he just blows me away with his intensity yeah um and also you know he he doesn't have to be intense in every movie but there's He's just this effortless guy. But what did you see in these actors that led to casting them and now they're just huge stars? Ben Foster, I had my eye on since he was 18 years old. And I have a, a picture, which I show my students. I have a whole collection of first pictures and resumes. And I had Ben's first picture and resume. And he had come off of a Barry Levinson film as well. And... I had him come in and, and meet me and he was just so incredibly smart. And he looked at my refrigerator and, and he was like, you got any beer in there? I was like, I sure do. And he goes, can I have one? And so we just literally sat on the floor, drank a beer and just shot the shit. And I was like, I fucking love this kid. And so Alpha Dog, when Alpha Dog came around a few years later, he's the very first actor I brought to Nick. And Nick wow. didn't, did, didn't know who he was. I said, you've got to meet this kid. And so Nick came in. Nick generally doesn't read anybody. He just likes meeting actors. And, and, and he, he, he said his criteria with me is like, only bring me three actors because I want to hire them all. And, you know, the, everybody thinks, you know, they, they're, they're, their client got, got the role because they have such a great time with Nick that I have to go, no, no, that's just how Nick is. He didn't get the role. You know, we're just meeting people. You know, tell them to hold on. But with, with Ben, Ben came in and sat down with Nick and was exactly how I expected Ben to be just incredibly bright, smart, terrific. And Nick said, so, you know, which role you like, you know, thinking that he wanted to play Jesse James Hollywood, you know, the lead. And he goes, I like this role. And Nick perked up and went, really? Tell me why. Hmm. He said, cause I think I can do, you know, I can do a lot with this role. This is the kind of role that, that I want to play and, 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 and proceeded to tell Nick, everything about him. And literally Nick said, rolls yours. And the friend looked at him and was like, really? He was like, yeah, rolls yours. It's yours. Wow. And so that was, that was the first, first one. Amanda, which is, which is, this is a funny story. Amanda, uh, what her agent was, uh, a, a gal by the name of Abby Bluestone. And we went to high school together in New York. And Abby was like my only friend in high school. Because uh, we went to the professional children's school because we were all professionals. And and Abby called me up and she goes, you got to meet this girl. You, you got to meet this girl. I was like, okay, you know, I'll do anything for Abby. So so this girl, Amanda, walks in. I had never met her. Nick had never met her. She sits down and proceeds to cry. And she was just like, you know, she was 17 years old. And she was like, I don't want to do your movie. I just want to go home. I just, I just miss my family. And she was like crying the entire, she literally cried the entire time. For real. Like a For real, real cry. Like okay. really, like, like, it's like, she was like, please don't hire me. I don't want to be in your movie. I just want to go home. And, and, and so of course, Nick looking at, decided to torture her and kept her there for an hour. And she was just so lovely and vulnerable and so we had to, we just, we had to find something in the movie for her. Yeah. And how can you was, not work with her? After how can that? you not? And, yeah. and and he was just like, so there's nudity in this movie. You have a problem with that? I don't care. I don't care. And she was 17 at the time. She was going to be 18 by the time she, she was shooting. And so we immediately, we immediately were like, I was like, Abby, she's in the movie. She just let her know she's in the movie. So she went home, got to see her family. And then of course she got really excited. Yeah. And uh, pretty much, and I mean, pretty much everybody in that movie became became a star. I mean, you know, uh, Amber Heard was in the movie. You know, she had just she she just came in and was just like, she was a tornado. Mm -hmm. And it was like you couldn't have just the energy, just her energy was like, was like oh yeah, she's got to be in the movie. Um, Emil was uh, was was interesting because it was down to Emil and another another actor, and 
And this other actor, we had hired Ben, and this other this other actor came in, and they were aud- auditioning together. And literally, what happened was they they were doing this intense scene. I think it was one of the one of the intense scenes in the movie, and they literally got into a fist fight hmm. in the in the audition. It turns out later <laughs> that they knew it that they knew each other. But right. you know, I'm like I'm having to go in and break it up. And Nixon, you know, behind the table, laughing his ass off. You know, he's like, I love the intensity. So it was literally down to to, to Emil or this or this other guy, and we we went with Emil because Emil was was he was kind of this good looking, kind of punky, kind of he fit the part. He fit the part a, a little better than this other actor who was who was probably a little bit of, of a better actor. But Emil was kind of softer, so you knew he was he would kind of fold a little bit as his, as his character. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Olivia Wilde was another one who nobody really knew. And what had happened with Olivia was she came in and she was just, you know, just wild and open and didn't give a shit about anything. And what happened was, is that we brought back three girls for, for that role. And what we didn't tell them was we had hired all the guys and we brought all the guys in and they had them sit behind the table and the girls came in and all Nick told the guys to do is to give her shit. Olivia walks in. The first thing she said was like, you know, is, is that a, you know, something she made some comment about, about one of the guys like having a small, you know, penis. Oh, she gave it it right back then. Gave it right, (laughs) right back. And it just kept going on and on and on. The guys were like hooting and hollering and they were like, she's in. She's because she's one of, she was one of the guys. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, uh, uh, Timberlake, we had, we had wanted, we had met Justin, uh, on a previous picture that didn't go and we loved uh, Timberlake and Nick, Nick had suggested Justin early on. And I said, hell yes. Uh, I said, anybody who's a musician, let him come in, let him talk to you about it. And he said, can, you know, can I just make this, this character fun? Absolutely. And every, nobody liked the idea. It was one of those where this is the worst idea. This is horrible. He can't act. He's a, you know, he's a boy band guy. And we're like, no, mm-hmm. no, we went against we went against everything, and he was phenomenal, just phenomenal in the film. And it's one of the, it's 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 a cast, one of the casts that I'm incredibly proud of, just because everybody, almost everybody on that on that poster just blew up after that. Yeah, you know, and it just and it just it it really to this day makes me incredibly proud to to have, to have put that one together. Um, and what a job, and what, a, yeah. I, I watched it leading up to to Nick's uh, interview, and and I was str- it was the second or third time that I'd seen the film, maybe more, because it's it's one of those those movies that you can go back and watch again, you know, once a year, and it's still fresh, it still holds up, um, and it and it ages well. But one of the things I I noticed about the film the last time I watched it was it is a real pressure cooker of a movie with all of the intensity from yeah. all of these actors and and there's also the subtlety and nuance of the performances because for for instance Demille Hirsch when he's when he's looking at the intruders in his house and he's he's watching one of them take a shit on his carpet you know and yeah. he's just kind of cowering and yeah. you realize this kid is he's not a, a badass he he has right. a lot a lot of bark and no bite. Right. And, exactly. and, I th- and there were so he needs these people who will do these acts for him because he doesn't have the courage to do it. Right. And it's that type of nuance that I love in these performances. But then it's also like watching a train wreck too, because it's like you see these two trains coming at each other and you're like, oh shit. Like this this is not gonna end well. You just know right from the beginning, this is not going to end well. <laughs> well, and, and as an audience too, it's like, you think, okay, how is this kid going to get out of it? Right. And he, and he doesn't, that's the whole thing is that that's the shock about yeah. to an audience because, you know, you watch these films and you go, okay, somebody's going to come by to save the day. You know, somebody will, somebody will come by, you know, some, yeah. something will happen and and this kid will be saved because you, you feel for him. And yeah. then all of a sudden you just, and, and when, when he's shot, it's so freaking heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking, it and is. and and it's just and it just leaves you just with this with this this feeling in your gut of like, oh my god, this this didn't end the way I thought it, thought it would. You know, how's this how's this going to play out now? 
Yeah, and the the beautiful thing about it too is that Nick was able to capture this story and he just grabs it. It's it's out there and he grabs it and puts it on paper in a, in a screenplay, right? And he he puts this film together in a way that I I don't think, you know, you could read this story in a GQ write up or Vanity Fair or Rolling Stone or something and it just would not hit the way that it came together through through your casting and through through Nick's direction. Um and it's it's one of the the best uh teenage you know sort of thriller dramas I think of of that decade. I I think it still holds up to and anybody who's who's listening to this who's who's young should really watch watch that film because it's it's kind of I mean that was you know what 12 13 years ago uh, yeah. maybe maybe even longer but it's still holding up to this day, you know, with, with the youth that's, you know, the, the, the anger and the, and the angst that, that the youth of today, you know, and the pressures of the youth of today, you know, have, and just, and just the, the, the lack of, of parenting, um, yeah. that's, you know, and these, these kids, you know, a lot of them, you know, they weren't poor kids, you know, they were, you know, some of them were well off. Yeah. Most of them, most of them were well off. And, mm-hmm. Wow, the decisions you 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 know you make as 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 a young adult, and if you're a young actor listening to this, it's one that it's a film that you should study, uh, especially all of the characters, uh, in you know in the film. You know, mm-hmm. it's a, it's an it's a, just a, an incredible piece for all of the actors. You know, not just not just you know Justin's performance, but you know, and but Emile's and 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 Ben's and every everybody in the in the film. Yeah, it's. I think it's a good example of the duality of man, and it showing that every character in that film has the capacity for good and evil. And every in every scene, they have the ability to make a different decision. And it's just almost by chance that they decide, you know, to keep going on this path that's going to lead to something horrible happening. But they could just as easily make a different decision, pick up the phone and call right. the police or something. Right. And then everything would be completely different. Right. Um, but it's it's a fascinating study in that respect. Well, well, I mean, again, look look at look at what's going on in the world right now. You know, I mean, it's like yeah. the the decisions. You know, it's 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 that close. I, I'm a big believer in we make choices. You know, we we all have. I, I don't believe in regrets because you 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 make choices. You know, if, if you decide to cheat on your spouse, well, that's your choice. You know, live with that choice. You, you have to suffer the consequences. You know, what choice are you going to, are you going to make? Are you going to make the the right choice or the wrong choice? We all, we all make choices. Again, as, as a lawyer, you know, as well, we make choices and those choices affect, you know, (laughs) if you wind up in court or not. Right. So, so. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. One, 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 uh, actor I, 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 I stupidly failed to mention was the incredible Anton Yelchin, um, the late, great Anton Yelchin, um, who again, you know, nobody knew except my partner who had seen him in a film and they were, they were I can't remember the other actor they were tr- trying to push on us to, to play that role. And Nancy was, was like, no, it's gotta be Anton. It's gotta be Anton. It's gotta be Anton. And Anton came in. And I think it was, he was 16 at the time and he was just so innocent and so beautiful. And just, it was like, oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I give, I give my partner, Nancy, full credit for that one. So he, he passed away. Yeah, he was, he, he, um, unfortunately he was, he had a driveway, uh, that had a, a steep hill and he had a Jeep at the top of it and he thought he had put it in park. Okay. And yeah. and he didn't, and it it backed into him and and crushed him. I remember now. Yeah, and I remember the story. Yeah, absolutely, incredibly heartbreaking, and and just a, an incredibly talented. I'm getting choked up just thinking about it. Um, and his mom was just such a sweetheart, just a just a, a lovely, incredible woman. And to lose to lose him that early, and to lose mm-hmm. you know everything that 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 he had done in his career. Um was just was just this is really really sad one more casting question sure. before we move on to your acting classes um the she's so lovely movie uh, <laughs> yeah. nick, nick talked about it a a read or a, an introduction with john travolta 
and I think Sean Penn was there and there was some drama. Uh, I don't know if you heard that interview or not, but um, with Robin Wright Penn and Sean and were you involved in that particular meeting that Nick was referring to where uh, John Travolta showed up and the kind of the, the stars aligned and, and he agreed to take on that role? I was there the day that, that he said, yes, I remember that. I okay. remember that, that, that Sean and Robin had, had come on and, and we went after to, to, we went, went after John and he said, yes. And everybody, everybody was, was excited. Yeah. Um, I don't know what happened, it happened afterwards, but I know Sean really took, you know, was really, really invested in the film. Um, and I know that, that like after the first day of, of shooting, they had shot John and, and, and Nick and Sean had some, some difference of opinions. And so we had to do reshot that scene. Um, but I thought they were, they were all, all terrific. And Gandolfini, the late James, oh, great Jimmy Gandolfini. Yeah. What a great was, actor. Oh, was so great in that. And, and yeah. yeah. Was that one of his, one of his first films? That was one of his, I, I actually, I met, I put James, okay, here's a funny story. And I hope Nick is not listening to this because he's not going <laughs> to like what I have to say, but I may have told him this. I may not have, but I'm going to, I'm going to kind of out myself here. So I was doing a film when I was working with Vicky uh, called Money for Nothing with uh, John Cusack. And we were looking for John's brother in the film. And we met this, this guy, he was working at, he was working uh, as a dock worker, I think in Pittsburgh. And he came in. Uh, and was just incredible. And uh, Nick had come in in Los Angeles. Of course, Nick was one of my best friends. And it was down to Nick and James Gandolfini to play Cusack's brother. And we watched the tapes. We watched the tapes, and you know, the director said, you know, asked everybody's opinions, and and said, Matt, what do you think? And I went, Gandolfini. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to. I had. I had to vote against against my you know one of my best friends, but I oh. thought Gandolfini was better for the better for the role. Oh yeah, I think he'll so, forgive you because it was Gandolfini. If it oh. was anybody else, maybe not. But I'll give you. I'll give you one yeah. one last Gandolfini story. I know you pressed press for time, but one last Gandolfini story. So I'm doing a film called uh, Crimson Tide, and uh, we're looking for for this one of these characters. Can't find it. 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 We, he wanted uh, Tony Scott had wanted Gandolfini because he had done a true romance with Gandolfini, but Gandolfini wasn't available. Hmm. So so couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. We're close to, close to filming. Close to filming. At the last minute, the schedule changes, and I look at the schedule and I call his agent and I said, "Wait, a minute, is Gandolfini going to be available?" And he called me back and he said, "Well, he's shooting a film in France, but..." His last day is your first day of filming. So I said, can we make it work? And of course, Gandolfini wanted to work with Tony Scott and wanted to be with his film with Denzel. And so it works out. So Gandolfini flies, flies in, literally sleeps in his trailer on the set. First day of set, first day, first day, very first day of, of, of filming. And we're on this thing called a gimbal. And a gimbal is basically a set that's on these gigantic hydraulics because we're in a submarine. Mm -hmm. And so they need to move the, you know, the submarine for the angles. And the cameras are, are off. They have to push the, the, you know, the entire set away so they can move this gigantic set so they can go on an angle. And so all it is is the actors and then the camera crew is on the other side of, of, the, of the gimbal. And so the very first scene is a confrontation scene between Denzel's character and Gandolfini's character. And so we rehearse it where, you know, uh, Gandolfini puts his hand on Denzel and Denzel slaps it away and everybody draws their guns and cut. That's, that's the first, right? First take and action. Gandolfini grabs Denzel. Denzel hits him. Gandolfini doesn't let go. Denzel hits him again. Gandolfini <laughs> doesn't let go. Oh, no. They they start to tussle. They start to tussle. Gandolfini punches Denzel. Oh my god! And w since we're on a, this this angle, this gimbal, they start going out of frame, out of camera. And us as actors, I was actually on the set at the time. I, I drove the submarine. We're going. What the hell? What the hell is? And everybody starts going. Hey, 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 hey! They start. They start. <laughs> That's not in the script. <laughs> no, they start tussling. You know, they're trying to get the gimbal back up to to regular so we can. You know, Denzel is furious, and of course, you know, since I worked on the film, casting it, I was I was working with, with Vicky at the time. 
I was like, oh my God, we don't have a backup. Please don't fire him. Please don't fire him. And Denzel was hot. And this is again, this is the first day and Rockheimer's <laughs> there and Tony Scott's there. And so about an hour later, you know, Gandolfini comes back and apologizes. He said, look, you know, I'm a method actor. I just, I haven't had time to really get into the character. And I just, I just went, I apologize. And so, of course, everything was cleared up, but it was like, yeah. oh my God, the first day of filming. Yeah. And Denzel was shit. big at that time. Big. It was huge. Yeah. Yeah. Man, it was big hit. Big hit too. <laughs> well, uh, so I, I'd like to ask you about your your acting classes and Matthew Berry teaches because I've, I've looked at your website and I am just so impressed with the talent that comes out of your class and how loyal, talking about loyalty, how loyal they are to you to um to give you those types of um you know accolades on your website when did you start teaching acting uh it's about nine years ago um somebody in a, a friend of mine in san francisco said you know hey you know what do you think about you know coming up here and, and teaching a class and this was probably you know at the height of my career and i was like yeah okay i've never done it before but you know sure why not so i went up there and loved it and realized that I was good at it. And again, I had growing up in, in New York, I had worked with uh, Lee Strasberg at the, at the actor studio. And I didn't get along with Lee very well because I didn't really like his methods at the time. And I did, and I did study as well at HB studios with, you know, a variety of teachers, including the great Uta Hagen. So I had, you know, I had kind of a, you know, an, a, a vast education on theories, techniques, uh, and basically I decided I'm not going to enforce my technique on them. I want, I want actors to be organic and I want to try and I can, I can definitely get the, the best out of every actor. And so I quickly realized, Hey, this, this is a lot of fun. And it kind of grew and grew and grew and everybody and everybody kept asking me, Hey, will you know, will you, will, you know, can I work with you? Can I work with you? And it was just like, Oh my God. Okay. I just don't, I don't have the time. I don't have the time. And then, and then as the years went, went by, I found myself enjoying it more and more and more and helping actors, you know, live their dreams. And as the business changed, I found that I was enjoying, you know, educating and teaching actors. I love actors and, and it really coming, being an actor and making the mistakes that I made, I can help actors to not make those mistakes, to be professional and to teach them all about being a professional, uh, not, you know, a lot, uh, you know, letting your e putting your ego aside and just doing the work. And basically the advantage I had over a lot of other teachers was I was, a, I was a successful actor and I was a successful casting director. So I know what, I know what I'm doing. And so I took that knowledge and and impart that onto my students who obviously have an advantage over your traditional act, acting studios where I know how to work the camera. I know how I know what a great audition is like. I know how to work, you know, there's a big difference between stage acting, acting and and auditioning. But a lot of people don't know the difference. And so I teach them the difference, especially when it comes to camera work and especially being on the other side. I wish that I had known half the things I knew, you know, as an actor that I do in casting, I probably would have booked a lot more jobs. Like, you know, not using props, for example, is, you know, all the things that can cost you a job. There's so many ways, so many things that will cost you a job that I try and eliminate them all so that the director focuses on you and your talents. And so that's another, another way. My job is to get the best out of you, you know, mm -hmm. like, like, a, like a, whether it's, you know, a baseball coach or a football coach, their job is to get the, the, the most out of, you know, your athletic ability. Well, my job is to get the most out of your emotional ability. And so I, you know, I, I'll push you, I'll push you, I'll push you until you are just so comfortable that you can do anything. And mm. that is incredibly rewarding for me. Not only that, but it, 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 it's so rewarding for me to help people achieve their dreams. You know, we all have dreams. We all have goals in life. And, and, and if I can be a part of that, it's, it's so rewarding. It's, in, it's, it's a great feeling. Like, you know, when I'm working on a film and you cast a perfect cast, it's rewarding. It's a great feeling. It's, you know, when my students book and they tell me they, you know, they've booked, it's, 
it's a great feeling when they're, you know, booking TV series, when they're going on to have great careers. It's a great feeling. And so I continue to do it. And I opened this, you know, this wonderful studio I have here in, in Sherman Oaks. And, you know, I have, you know, nice, nice, comfortable leather chairs and good seating and, you know, good food and snacks and, and, and a, a, a nice environment for, for the actor to kind of nurture. Cause you know, actors are, can be a very, very fragile group. And, you know, my job is to, is to give them that confidence, you mm -hmm. know, to go out there. Auditioning sucks. You know, I, I, you know, doing, doing casting for 28 years, it's horrible. You know, I, it's nerve wracking, you know, being in front of somebody and saying, you know, please, I know you're judging me, but you know, please, can you just give me a shot? And it's like, no, just go, it, it, just to, to try and, you know, impart on the actor that no, just go in and, and not give a crap. You know, we want you. You know, we want to see you. We want your personality. Come in and just be you. That's what gets you the job. That and talent, of course. Yeah. Um, but it's just, it's nice to see when it's not phony, when it's not, when it's not nerves. Of course, it's going to be, you're going to be nervous. It's nerve wracking. So I try and, and teach everybody how not to be nervous, just to go in, do your thing. And, and the, the rest is complete. It's out of your hands. You yeah. never, you don't know, you don't know, you know, what goes on you know, but behind, behind the, the, the doors. I remember when I was an actor, I went, I went, there was a TV series we all wanted to do called the uh, Hill street blues. Mm, I remember and, I, it well. and I went, went in all the time and the casting directors loved me. And I went in and there's this one role worked on it all weekend, went in and just crushed it. I was like, you know, this job is mine. Nobody's better for this role is mine. You know, and I'm waiting for the phone. I'm like, you know, is my phone working? You know, and I'm checking this. <laughs> I'm checking to see, you know, is, why is my agent called? I call my agent. Have you heard anything? I didn't get the job. Why? About six weeks later, the the, the show comes on 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 the air. And I go, okay, who who got the job? Who who got who was better than me? And I watched watch it. And, and, and okay, here here comes. I know I know the script. Here comes the scene. Oh, it's Forrest Whitaker. And, you know, it's it, okay. If I have my choice between hiring Forrest Whitaker or Matt Barry, I'm hiring Forrest Whitaker. Right. You know? <laughs> so it's, so as an actor, I try, I try and impart that on you. It's like, you don't know what goes on, you know, behind closed doors, you know, an, another film, I, I, I went back three times for this TV movie. I was fantastic. Director loved me. Producer loved me. Phenomenal, phenomenal role. The role was mine. I didn't get it. And so film comes out, you know, comes on if, you know, a year later or so, who got my role? Who got my, okay. oh, Jim Carrey got my role. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and Jim was great. And I went, oh, that, the funny guy, the, 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 this guy got my, oh, well, and I got to hand it to him. He was, he was better than me. Yeah. He was, he was more right for the role than me. I get it. Well, I, I saw an interview with um, an Austrian actor by the name of Christoph Walls. Yeah. From Inglorious Bastards. And it was just last night I was watching this. Um, it was he was on uh, Jerry Seinfeld's Comedians in Cars getting yeah, coffee. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I watched that. And uh, but he said, if if you put a great actor in the wrong role, you're going to get a bad performance. Yep. And I, I think that reminds me of what you're talking about, which is these producers, these directors, these catching directors are probably looking for not just great actors, but the right actor for this particular role. And you can never know that as an actor. Yep. So you can't take it too personally. It sounds like you can't, you can't, I mean, it's, it's, you know, as, as a producer, I'm offered up, you know, actors all, all the time. And I, and, and, and it's so tempting because I know I'll get the, the project made, but it's wrong. Right. You know, it, it's not right. I'm putting in an actor in a role that, that, you know, I feel he, he, he can't handle or isn't right for, or the audience isn't going to believe. Now I'm all for, Yes, you know, can you know, can Will Ferrell do drama? Yes, but it's got to be the right drama. Mm -hmm. You know, can can a comedian, can Jim Carrey do you know do drama as well? Yes, if it's it's the right role. You know, can a dramatic actor do do comedy? Uh, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've had that experience. You know, where they go, oh, he can be funny. He is funny, but you know, sometimes it works. Like you know, the other woman. You know, um, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Nikolai Costa Waldau. Yeah. Nobody ever thought he was funny, but we knew he was funny and we showed the studio he was funny. And guess what? He was funny. He was. So it's, 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 
it's got to be, it's got to be, it's got to be right. And sometimes you got to convince, convince people that, you know, that they're, they're right for the, for the job. Well, Matthew, it's been great talking to you. Um, can you, can you let our listeners know where they can find you on social media and um, the web? Uh, the website is uh, www. Do we still have to say that now? <laughs> no, w- I don't w- think so. <laughs> um, uh, MatthewBarryTeaches.com. That's with two T's, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, MatthewBarryTeaches.com. A lot of information. Anybody can reach out to me if you, uh, you can answer it. I answer every question from, from anybody, um, you know, agents, managers, you know, anything that, that you know, actors have. Uh, it might take me a day or two to get, get back to you, but I will answer everything. Uh, I'm on all of the social media. I'm on Facebook. Uh, Twitter is Big Mouth Barry because I'm a big hockey fan, and I have a big mouth when it comes to hockey. So um, nice. it, it, Big Mouth Barry is my Twitter handle, but uh, the rest is uh, Matthew Barry on uh, – or uh, Matthew Barry teaches on, on Instagram. I'm not on TikTok yet, but I, I guess I have to get a, get on there. Oh, another uh, one. Yeah. I got to figure that one out. <laughs> it's all, it's all the kids. We're getting, we're getting old, man. We're getting yeah. old. We can't keep up. Can't keep up. Yeah. Well, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, Matthew. Thanks for sharing your story about your life. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for doing this. It's wonderful that, you know, and thank you everybody for listening, for taking the time uh, to, 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 you know, sit through everything that, that you have to offer. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. I had a great time. Thank you. All right. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.